a lot of people know what water is as H2O, but how is the water in our biology different from the water that we drink? Well, it, first of all, it's not H2O. So H2O has three phases, the solid, liquid, and vapor phases. In our experimental work, we discovered what amounts to a different phase of water. And that phase fills our bodies, fills all our cells. The physical chemical properties of the water we're talking about, this so-called fourth phase water that we call, sometimes we call it EZ or exclusion zone uh, water because it has a tendency to exclude particles and, and solids, just like ice. And it does re re resemble ice in some ways. It's not solid, it's, it's gel-like. And it fills your body, or it fills our, our bodies, mine and, and, and yours. If you read a cell biology book, it starts with a discussion of water, uh, chapter one, right away. And then for the rest of the book, the word water is ignored. The idea is that um, uh, cells are filled with liquid water, all that the liquid water does is it dissolves the more important molecules of life. That's what the book tells you. So it touches on water to begin with, but then it completely forgets about water for the rest of the book. Well, everything that we found in the laboratory is completely antithetical to that. The opposite of what's in the cell biology book, because the book says that water does basically nothing. And what we find from our experimental evidence is that water does everything. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, my cells are, my cells are filled with, with water, uh, uh, n not liquid water, nothing else. So if you take um, what you might consider to be a typical cell, and that is a, a raw egg, okay? So, um, and, and take the raw egg white. Is it a, is it a liquid or is it a gel? Uh, I think that everybody would, would say that it's a gel. And, um, and gels have the consistency of easy water. It's just filled with easy water. So that's one way of kind of, of discerning that cells are filled uh, with easy water, not, not with liquid water. But there's another way if you're brave enough. And I guess you guys are pretty brave. Uh, so, um, so you take a razor blade, a really sharp razor blade, <laughs> and uh, you take your arm and run it along your arm. So you cut yourself. Now, if your cells were filled with liquid water, the water would come pouring out uh, as it would from a breached water pipe. But that's not what happens. Uh, the, the water or whatever aqueous uh, entity is inside the cell, it stays inside the cell. It doesn't come. You've got plenty of blood coming out, but you don't have water coming out. And the same thing will be, uh, will be told to you by surgeons. You know, they'll open up your belly, go digging deep, and and take their scalpel and cut cut through a muscle. And to their surprise, what comes out is not water. They expected water to come out, but water doesn't come out. It's a gel that's inside. And the gel is basically a gel because it consists of easy water, which which has gel gel-like properties. So you asked me a simple question and I've given you a complicated answer, but that's the way it goes. So we have this gel-like water in our biology. And again, if anyone hasn't read the cells, gels, the engines, you, you kind of poke through these yeah, dogmas, I guess you call them really, just this thought that has been taught for decades. And, and there's simple tests to prove that, like you're saying, if you, know, you cut yourself or if you puncture a cell, uh, you'd expect a lot of you know, things to happen, a lot of things to come out, um, the cell to die, um, and it doesn't. So my question to you is, yeah, how do, how does this exclusion zone form um, in our biology? Um, you know, we have bulk water, so we do have some form of normal water. What is the relationship between the exclusion zone and then the bulk water? Okay, good question. So I, I will convey this to you in, in a sense, historically. Um, and uh, we started, to, I, I had been studying muscle contraction for several decades. I got interested in water when I listened to a lecture from a guy named Gilbert Ling. And Gilbert Ling um, came from China. He was in the first cohort um, uh, of, of um, young investigators to come from China to the U.S. after World War II. It was 1948 that he came. They picked three people. They picked a, a physicist, a chemist, and a biologist. He was the biologist. They picked these people from all throughout China. And the physicist went on to win a Nobel Prize. And my Chinese student tells me that the chemist also won a Nobel Prize, but I'm, I'm not sure of that. And Gilbert Ling was the kind of guy, his, 
um, his experiments and his theories and whatever should have won at least two Nobel prizes, mm -hmm. but they passed him by. He was he was very controversial. His main point. His main point was that inside the cell, the water is not like liquid water, or I should say, not like um, like this glass of water that I, I I have here. He said that the molecules are um, aligned; they 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 kind of stack on one another. The water molecules stack on one another, just like soldiers at attention. And when I heard that, I was com completely uh, uh, captivated by it. And actually, uh, I gave one of his books to some of my students, and they all came back saying, "This is so incredible. This is really important. And if if uh, if he's right, then all of biology will need to be rewritten because it's based on a different presumption." Well, so that's when we started. You know, I, I wrote the book "Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life" to make Gilbert Ling's ideas compatible uh, with with a rudimentary understanding. You know, Gilbert, he passed a few years ago at age 100. Gilbert was brilliant, but like many brilliant people, somehow they, they haven't, haven't the capacity to present their work, their written work in digestible form, easily digestible form. And, and Gilbert was one of those. It, it may be that the Chinese language, the word editing uh, is absent. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. But you know our stuff. We write something, and we look at it a few days later and say, "Well, what did I write? I can't, I can't really understand what I've what I've written." Editing is absolutely essential, but he never did a whole lot of editing. So I, in in the book that I wrote, "The Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life," two thousand one, I tried my best to make his ideas palatable. But after doing that, it was so intriguing that uh, obviously we we had to we had to look into it and see. Um, you know, uh, uh, what could we do to amplify what Gilbert Ling had found? And just to mention, I mean, we, we, I'll tell you how that led to easy water in a moment, but, but, um, 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 we, we, it, it, it's just that we, we, well, we had, there was no choice. Uh, we had to study water because it was so intriguing. We, and we started with Gilbert Ling's idea. And so, so his idea uh, was that this special kind of water, which he called structured water, as did other people, um, has a capacity. It's like a crystal. You know, all the molecules are organized, as, as is the case in the crystal. And so if you have a pure crystal, it means that any contaminants that were there originally need, need to be excluded. Need, you need to get rid of the contaminants to have something, something that's, that, that's pure. And um, and since it's like a crystal, um, and it excludes, uh, we were we started doing experiments looking for something, some what we thought might be crystalline-like, and something that excludes. And and we found it rather quickly due to a few quirks, uh, uh, or a few lucky lucky breaks, uh, meeting the right people, knowing the right people, getting the right hints, and that way it turned out to be very simple. So what that is. Is you take a chamber, and you put a, a, some sort of material in the chamber. We started out using gels. Um, it was actually a polyvinyl alcohol gel, but it doesn't matter because all all um, hydro um, uh, aqueous gels, that is a gel built built from water, um, they all show the same phenomenon. So we took the gel, we put it in the chamber, we added water, and we added little particles we used microspheres and and we were hoping to find some region um where the microspheres were excluded because if there's a crystal there the crystals a pure crystal would exclude those particles those microspheres and we found it and we found it right away we found it right next to the gel right next to the gel uh, at first at time equals zero at first the microspheres were uniformly disposed. And if, if you were to watch it, which we did um, over a period of five or 10 minutes, you'd find that right next to the gel, the microspheres just started to disappear. They began to be excluded. And that's why we call it exclusion zone. Um, they began to be excluded. And about, about seven or eight minutes uh, after the process started, the exclusion zone 
became uh, basically uh, constant. So a zone built right next to uh, the gel, and since then next to many surfaces, uh, uh, um, if they're hydrophilic or water loving. And that exclusion zone, it turned out, had properties, uh, numerous properties that we measured, and each physical chemical property differed from the properties of ordinary water. So we began to call it fourth phase water because, um, because it was much more interesting than just uh, uh, excluding particles. Later, we found it excludes virtually everything. It doesn't exclude everything, because we don't know because we haven't studied everything. <laughs> But it it's generally exclusive, and it's a, a pretty a pretty pure liquid crystal. So that's if, does that answer your question about how how we found it? Um, pl please ask. If not, I'm happy to expound for a absolutely. Yeah, no, it, it's fascinating. I was just going to say what I found really fascinating about it is when you think of water generally and then this exclusion zone water, what, another property that sort of makes it unique is that it's net negatively charged. And I sort of wanted you to just get into briefly about why that is unique, but also why it is important um, from an energy perspective when we think about things as maybe this idea of water being a battery um, as opposed to thinking about ATP as the energy currency. Um, I've heard you talk about that pretty pretty at length, but oh, I find it super fascinating. Questions, but... <laughs> yeah, no, I know. We'll start. Okay. We'll start with yeah. the negative, net negative yeah, charge. Yeah. Why so, that? We, we didn't know that it was negatively charged. We found so there's this exclusion zone sitting next to the gel, and then there's ordinary water, and um, uh, you know, having having training in electrical engineering, you can you can understand that we were curious about the electrical properties of the zone, so we stuck electrodes into the exclusion zone well, two electrodes because if you want to measure potential difference you need a reference so one ele one electrode in that zone and one elect the other electrode in some remote position inside the water and lo and behold we found it's not neutral it's negatively charged and we were astonished because you know who who would have expected that it's negatively charged later uh, we we began to reason well wait a second we started with neutral water if this zone is negatively charged, you've got to be positive charges somewhere else because, you know, you can't just create negativity uh, unless you have a negative outlook. You can't create negativity without having positivity, right? Because you need to add minus and plus to give you what you started with, which is neutral. And we found it. And the positive charge uh, consisted of protons or, uh, in fact, hydronium ions because protons Protons combine immediately with water molecules to give you so-called hydronium ion, which is really nothing more than sort of positively charged water. And that existed just beyond the exclusion zone. So you've got negative exclusion zone next to positive hydronium ions, negative positive. That's a battery. So, so we, we found that, that the original water molecule or water molecules, I should say, is what we started with. They're neutral. They have no energy, no nothing. Uh, but they separated. They separated into what constitutes a battery. And we found it, if we stick one electrode in the negative, another electrode in the positive, we could, so you got a potential difference, run some wires to uh, an LED lamp, we could light the lamp. So it means that from water, to start with, just putting the water next to a hydrophilic surface, we get a battery. And this battery um, can, proof of principle, uh, can produce electrical energy. So, of course, the question arises, um, you know, how much, how much electrical energy can be produced? And we haven't gotten to that stage yet. We don't know how much can be, be produced. But, but if you think about it, it could be substantial and, and um, when scaled up. And the reason that I think it could be substantial is that this process of separating into plus and minus or minus and plus is the same thing that happens in uh, photosynthesis. The first step of photosynthesis um, is uh, through light. The light is, is incident on, on the plant, and then in the plant there is water, and the water separates into plus and minus. Um, 
OH minus and, and H plus. This has been well known for uh, a lot of years. And, um, and the separation is said to be 100% efficient. Well, if, if what we found is related to the first step of photo, photosynthesis, and I think it is, uh, probably nature has done the, the job better than we can do it, um, and you got 100% efficiency, what we found is very similar, the uh, breakage into plus and minus. It might be that our process is also highly efficient, though maybe not as efficient as in the plant, because nature nature does it best. So so that's pretty interesting. And it, it leads me to um to the natural follow up, you know, what what energy goes into charge of this battery or create even create the battery. Because all batteries you know your 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 phone. Uh, you forget to plug it in; it doesn't work. It's got to get recharged, right? And so, um, so the for the plant, um, it's light. And lo and behold, before we 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 could even envision um, this kind of energy getting transferred into electrical energy, um, we had, we had no idea. And I, you know, I found myself scratching my head. Trying to figure out where does the energy come from because you can't create energy from nothing. All you can do is, is you can take one kind of energy and convert it into another kind of energy. That that's one of the standard law, laws of of physics and chemistry that I think is it makes sense and it, I believe it's it's accurate. So we we're looking for now you can't take the chamber and plug it into a receptacle in the wall. <laughs> that won't give you energy. I suppose you could devise a way of doing it. So we didn't know where it came from. It turns out that an undergraduate student who didn't really know anything in, in any sophisticated way, he found the answer. And he was sitting, um, standing actually, uh, at, a, at a bench, a laboratory bench. Um, and he was playing around with a chamber that I described a few minutes earlier, uh, just a, a hydrophilic surface in water and uh, the water is, filled with microspheres looking at exclusion zones. And I guess maybe he was bored or maybe he was curious. I'm not sure which. He found a, a gooseneck lamp right next to him. He picked up the lamp and shined it on the chamber. And he saw something astonishing. So he called me in and I, I looked at it. The region of the exclusion zone uh, that was illuminated by the lamp um, the size of the exclusion zone grew to roughly three times the size. Um, we've we've seen up to ten times the size. It's really powerful. Um, uh, three times the size as the other regions that were illumin not illuminated. So, you know, it didn't take rocket sciences to figure out that the energy seemed to be coming from light, just like the photosynthesis uh, uh, issue. So. We we didn't know what what wavelengths of light because that incandescent lamp contains a range of wavelengths uh, uh, ranging from at the short wavelength range from from UV uh, through the visible range because you can see it uh, through the infrared because you can feel the heat and uh, and so we did experiments and uh, using LEDs of specific wavelengths and we found that ultraviolet did nothing actually it does something but it's another discussion. Uh, visible, the visible spectrum, um, almost nothing. When we got to the long wavelengths of red, we saw a very small effect, and we went beyond the red to infrared, the l longer wavelengths. Uh, it was astonishing what we found. Very tiny amounts of infrared energy could expand the exclusion zone enormously. We found up to up to ten times. Uh, we, we we found in some in some experiments. So, so basically, it's light. It's infrared light, um, and and that I guess that furthers the the um, the concept that what we're looking at is very similar to the first step of photosynthesis. Light comes, it breaks water, but we we kind of understand now what happens when the water breaks into negative and positive. So. What we may be looking at is uh, is indeed a, a generic form of photosynthesis, or the first step in photosynthesis, where the energy comes from, comes from light. 